Thanks for checking out the Vance Pittman Leadership Podcast. This is a conversation all about leadership, vision, and joining in God's activity wherever you are. You can find the show notes, links, and other helpful resources at hopechurchlv.com slash podcast, YouTube, or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Well, welcome to episode number 55 of the Vance Pittman Leadership Podcast. Whether you are joining us on uh, podcast audio or you're over here on YouTube, we are so glad you've joined us for another episode, 55 in, and we are um, excited about another episode specifically for leaders. We started this thing several years ago uh, just to equip and to pour into leaders uh, leading in different areas of life, uh, ministry, the marketplace, stay-at-home moms, whatever you may be doing, uh, tuning in today. We're glad you are joining us. If you haven't checked out other episodes, if somehow you just stumbled across this one, I uh, do encourage you to go online and and uh, check out the other 54 episodes that we have available. We interview people. We, we talk shop about ministry. We also um, just kind of go on the fly sometimes, and uh, all of that... Myself, uh, Scott here at Hope Church in Las Vegas, I do that with the man, the myth, the legend, my mentor, my pastor, my friend, Vance Pittman is in the building. Pastor Vance, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, Scott. <laughs> doing really good. I always get tickled listening to you do that. And then as you always introduce it, you say whether you're listening or you're watching us on YouTube over here, like YouTube is over here. YouTube guess, is right there. I guess you mean the <laughs> camera over here. Yep. Uh, we're not actually in the room with YouTube. But, uh, <laughs> oh, man, that was a dad joke right there. <laughs> was. That was a grandpa joke, actually. That's pretty bad. Huh? <laughs> no, I'm doing good, Scott. Uh, it's, you know, we're in, still in the middle of some transition going on, and so it's weird. Like, you and I just had lunch and really connected reconnected because we hadn't seen each other, I guess, since we were on a trip. The last time we recorded this, we were sitting in a hotel room in Phoenix, Arizona, I guess. That's right. That's um, right. So, yeah, no, doing great. Getting excited about uh, Easter's just around the corner and um, praying for what God does here at Hope and then at churches all over the Las Vegas Valley and all over the country. Uh, such an opportunity. I mean, if you really think about the magnitude of what happens that weekend globally, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people ushered into the family of God in one weekend. Um, it's pretty awesome to think about. Yep. So yeah, big, big, big weekend coming up. And for me, be my last, at least in this season of life, the last time I'll be preaching Easter as a senior pastor. So mm. uh, yeah, a lot of change, a lot of transition. Wow. If you have no idea what he's talking about, we have an entire episode dedicated to that <laughs> a few episodes ago. So you can scroll up in your feed and see um, the transition uh, we're talking about. But um, every every time we we have this podcast, we do want to just provide practical insights for you as a leader, wherever you're leading. And so that uh, today is no different. We're going to look at, as you saw in the title, five questions every spiritual leader should be answering. And uh, this is actually some content, Vance, that you shared with our staff a few years ago. And um, I thought, as I just looked over it um, today and this week as we prepared, uh, just very practical. So sometimes. Sometimes we'll, we'll tackle some leadership stuff that's kind of a little bit more intellectual, kind of heady stuff. This I really liked because it's so simple. Like if you're driving right now, if you are folding a load of laundry, if you're in your cubicle or your office just looking for some leadership hacks, like what can I do right now? I think what we're going to talk about today is very, very practical. The next time you meet uh, as a church, if you're a ministry leader, the next time you go into the office as a business leader, like these are some things you can be thinking about. And so I'm really excited to jump into the content today, Vance. Yeah. And like a lot of the things we talk about here on the podcast, um, obviously we want these principles and the questions we're going to address are applicable to anyone that's a Christian that's in leadership, those that are in positions of influencing other people, whether that's in the marketplace, in the church, in the home, um, wherever you have an opportunity to be an influencer, you are in leadership. And these questions are going to be applicable to all of us at some level, but in particular, those who find themselves working in the sphere of ministry where your position of leadership, either as a volunteer or as a, a paid staff person, is serving in and through a local church, these questions for sure are going to be applicable for you. Uh, again, applicable across the board, 
But in particular, a couple of these really are something that we want to be thinking about for those of us who find ourselves in leadership in the local church. So, yeah, excited about these these questions, Scott. So five questions every spiritual leader should be answering. We'll kind of say the, 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 the question, and then Vance will have you unpack it. So first one, as you're a ministry leader or a spiritual leader, who this is a question you should be asking, who are you pouring into? Yeah, I mean, at the core of the mission we've been given as followers of Jesus, I mean, if you were going to summarize the mission with two words, it's real simple. It's make disciples. Mm-hmm. That's the last thing Jesus told us when he ascended back to the, to the Father. I think one of the first questions he's going to ask when he returns is, tell me about the, that, that disciple-making thing. We, we, we read it in Matthew 28. We call it the Great Commission. But it says in Matthew 28, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountains, which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, and here it is, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So there, the imperative, the, the main verb in that passage of Scripture isn't go. It's make disciples. As followers of Jesus, we have been given the mission to make disciples. It is our primary mission. So if you're in leadership um, inside the church or outside the church, the primary calling on your life is not necessarily that position of leadership. The primary calling is to be about the business, the kingdom business of making disciples which means I'm supposed to be personally investing in the lives of others, seeing them come to Christ, grow in Christ, and discover their ability to live on mission for Christ. It's making disciples that make disciples. And if you're in ministry in particular, serving in a local church, if you're too busy in ministry to make disciples, you've forgotten what ministry is all about. Um, so many of us inside the church get so caught up in the business of ministry, the big task, the putting together the weekend schedule, the organizing of the events, the planning of the programming that we forget at its core, we're to be about making disciples. Um, Scott, as I think back over 30 plus years of ministry in my own life, the great joys for me are not moments, the great joys are the men that God allowed me to personally disciple. I, when I think back over 30 years, <coughs> I, I can remember a few, you know, big high water. I mean, we had a this last weekend at Hope, we had one of those unique Sundays where the Holy Spirit of God just chose to show up and show out. And we had so many people say, I think maybe the most people we've ever had saved in a given weekend outside of an Easter or Christmas Eve that's a huge evangelistic rally um, so sure, I'll, as I think back, I'll remember some moments like that. But when I think back over 30 years, the joy of ministry for me is the men that I've poured in my life into. And for my wife, the women that she's poured her life into. I mean, Scott, I think about a guy like you that I've been able to spend so many years with or on our team, Tom, who I personally discipled uh, almost 30 years ago. And I think back over the years of the people that God's allowed me to pour into. And then I think about my own life how Clyde Cranford discipled me. And today I'm touching all these lives that Clyde, in a sense, is vicariously impacting because he poured into me and made a, a difference in my life by discipling me. So we can't forget that, 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 that the primary call is not to lead. The primary call is to make disciples out of the overflow of our own love relationship with Christ. And that's the, that's the, the, the most important ministry that we have is the ministry of making disciples. So as a leader, who are you pouring into? And if you're not immediately thinking of the two or three people, for me, for the last 30 years, it's been between three to five men that I invite into a process, and I walk with them for between six months to a year and a half, depending on the group, depending on what we're walking through. But I'll just take between six months to a year and a half and meet with them once a week for about a year, and we just do life together, and I pour into them and disciple them. And as a leader, you need to be able to answer the question, who are you pouring into? So that's the first one, Scott. That's good. 
Second question, as a spiritual leader, ministry leader should be answering, not only who am I pouring into, but who's pouring in to you? Yeah, so you've heard me say this often on the podcast, leaders are learners. And the moment you stop learning, you forfeit the right to lead. And one of the ways that we learn, we've talked about this before, there are many ways we can learn through podcasts, we can learn through books, we can learn through watching things online. But one of the ways we learn is by walking with others in our lives who are pouring into us. Um, I'm in the process of the transition that I'm in right now of leading a new organization. And a part of the process that I'm doing is I'm evaluating this new organization from a five-fold vantage point. One piece of that is I've selected about 15% of our field staff, and I'm walking them through a 90-minute interview same 19 questions to glean information, to listen, and to learn from the field. Where'd that idea come from? I got a guy in my life who's a retired HR executive with Apple Computer named Daryl. Daryl has been executive coaching me for intentionally about 10 years, the last five years, just more he and I are friends and we continue to hang out and he continues to pour into my life. But for 15 years, this guy's just been pouring into me and taught me lessons that I'm now leading a large organization that's all over the continent of North America, but it's those principles I've learned by having someone pour into my life and speak into my life, and all of us need to not only be pouring into others, but we need to make sure that somebody's pouring into us. Uh, Here's a leadership reality, Scott, that I wrote down in my journal one day. Others can see weaknesses in your leadership that you cannot see because weaknesses are often born from strengths unguarded. Sometimes where, we're, where we become weak and vulnerable is in areas of our own life that we consider to be strengths, and we're so strong in those areas, we develop blind spots that we don't see some things that others can see. That's why the wisdom of Proverbs on this perspective, is on this principle, is so important. When Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Both words in there, the, the word walks and the word companion, both of those words are words that speak to relationship. The word walks means you do life with somebody. You're doing life with a group of people. The word companion is a word that indicates a relationship of friendship and intimacy between two people. And so the Bible here gives us instruction that as as leaders, if we're going to walk wisely, it's important that we're walking with others who are speaking into our lives that have enough relational equity in our lives to be able to, here's the way I like to say it, they, they know us well enough to call our bluff. Um, they know me well enough to know when what I'm saying is not accurate. What I'm saying doesn't line up with what I'm living. I need to have people pouring into my life um, because the reality is the relational choices that I make set the environment from which leadership decisions will be made. So I need to make sure that when those decisions come up in my life, I've got people that I trust, that walk with God, that know me, and that are pouring into my life. So who are you pouring into? And then secondly, Who's pouring into you? And as I ask those two questions, if you're listening to this right now, there should be names popping into your mind. This is who I'm discipling, bop, bop, bop. This is who's pouring into my life, bop, bop, bop. And if you don't have those names coming up into your life right now, if if you're not thinking of those names or you're having to struggle to come up with them, it's revealing an area of leadership that you need to work on um, and, and shore up in your own life personally. It's great. Number three, moving right along, who's on your heart? Yep. And this goes back to understanding that um, part of making disciples is connecting with people who don't know God, who are far from God, so that they can come to know God through you. One of the reasons, if you're listening to this and you're in leadership, one of the reasons God's given you that platform of leadership is because there are people who are around you in that sphere of leadership, either working alongside you as, as um, co-laborers or they're, they're underneath your structure of leadership, they're under your leadership, and some of them don't know Christ. And the reason God gave you that position of leadership maybe is not so much about your success or failure as a leader as much as it's about making himself known to the people in your circle of influence. Who in your circle of influence that doesn't know God... Mm-hmm that's far from God, God's brought into your life so that he can make himself known to them through you. Here's an interesting thought. Nobody ever meets Jesus 
without first meeting a follower of Jesus. You got to know a Christian before you can know Christ because it's through the proclamation of the gospel through that believer that, that others come to know Christ. Now, are there those rare experiences where somebody in another country, God makes himself known in a dream? Yes, that happens. But then what always happens is they go find a follower of Jesus who can then introduce them to the person of Christ. Um, so who are the people in your circle of influence? And again, names should be coming to your mind. The two, three, four people that do not know Christ who are far from God, that God's brought into your life so that they can come to know him through you. Um, Colossians chapter 4, I love these verses. In verses 5 and 6, listen to what it says. It says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how how you ought to answer each person. As you and I live our lives, we're to walk with wisdom toward outsiders. Who are these outsiders? People that are outside the family of God, people that don't have a relationship with God. Why are we to do that? So that we can make use of the time speaking to them in a way that represents who Jesus is and invites them to know Jesus. Um, I was reading in my God time one morning, Scott, in the book of Psalms, chapter 9, and I read this phrase, and the first time I read it, it was super encouraging because everything in me went, boy, that's so true. And then I got under such conviction. Here's the verse. Psalm verse nine, chapter 9, verse 10. It says, those who know your name put their trust in you. And my first thought was, oh, my gosh, that is so true. Like, I know his name, and no matter what happens today, I can put my trust in him. And then I had this deeply convicting thought by the Holy Spirit. Here was the thought. What about those who don't know my name? There are people that live on my street, your street live in this city, that every day wake up and they got the same issues, the same problems, the same challenges you and I have, and they don't have a God to turn to. They don't know the Jesus of the Bible. They don't have the truth of God to lean into. They're just having to, no wonder people are addicts. No wonder people turn to alcohol and drugs and sex and everything else. Because, listen, if I didn't have Jesus, I got to go somewhere. And so we wind up turning to all these other things and particularly those of us inside the church that are, that are serving in ministry in the church and leadership in the church, we can get so consumed with leading the church that we forget the mission of the church is to reach the people that don't know God, to come to know Christ. Um, and we have to be intentional. Those in spiritual leadership, here's, here's a challenge I would give you. If you're on staff at a church, if you're a pastor, if you're in leadership, in a church, even in a volunteer way. When's the last time you saw somebody baptized that you personally led to faith in Christ? Now, I know some people are more gifted evangelistically than others. I get that. Listen, I'm not the guy who's leading 10 people to Christ a week. We got some guys on our staff. That's just the way they're wired. It's not the way I'm wired. But if we go through one, two, three baptisms at Hope, and there's not somebody up there that I've directly influenced and they're coming to Christ, I need to ask myself, am I really living out what God's called me to be as a pastor, as a ministry leader, if I'm not leading people to Christ? So who's on your heart? Who are those that are far from God, that God's allowed to be close to you, that he wants to put on your heart so that they can come to know him through you? It's awesome. As you can see, again, trying to be really practical, ground-level stuff. I love it. Uh, question number four, we'll move right along. Who are you connecting? Yeah, uh, and at Hope Church, the way we say our mission, the way we unpack that statement of making disciples is we say it like this, and you know this, guy. Our, our mission is to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower. But it starts with this idea of connecting people. People come to know Christ. People get discipled in their walk with Christ in relationship, in community. Um, and so one of the questions I challenge our team with here is who are you connecting? And so this is applicable if you're on staff at a church, if you're a pastor, if you're a ministry leader, this is definitely applicable for you. Who are you connecting into the process of being made into a disciple that your fellowship is all about? But it's also applicable if you're a business leader. I think about people in our church who are, are architects or real estate agents or school teachers. I would love for every member of Hope Church to be asking this question every weekend. And let me make it real practical. Here's what I mean by this. Who are you connecting? 
the primary gathering that happens every week in the local church is that, that, that time when we gather together for worship. There's a lot that happens in and around that. Um, but, but what I challenged our team with is every weekend that you come on site for worship, you should not leave that weekend without five names of people that you are helping to take their next step in getting connected in the fellowship. For example, at our process at Hope, that would be a next step into what we call our Discovering Hope, which is our membership process, or the next step of uh, our getting connected into a small group, or the next step of getting connected and serving, or if it's a brand new person that's never been to church, uh, getting them connected and, and what it means to know Christ and setting up a conversation with them to come to know Christ. So if you're a Christian, prayerfully, you are engaged in a local church and hopefully you're using your gifts in leadership in the church and in service in the church. If you're on staff or pastoring a church, what if every person began to ask this question, who did I help this weekend in our gathering to take the next step in getting connected in our fellowship? And you can set the number for yourself. For our team, I set it at five. Maybe it's one. I'm, this weekend, I'm going to make sure there's I'm, – I'm going into church. I'm going to the gathering this weekend, not focused on what I'm going to get. I'm focused on what I'm going to give. And I'm looking for that person that I'm going to help take the next step. I'm walking in with my spiritual antennas up, looking for an opportunity to help somebody take their next step of getting connected. That's great. Who are you pouring into? Who's pouring into you? Who's on your heart? Who are you connecting? And here is the final one. Who's a potential leader on your radar? Yep, there's the last question. Who's a potential leader on your radar? You cannot lead effectively without developing new leaders. All of us have been entrusted with leadership, and this is real personal for me right now. All of us have been entrusted with leadership for a season. Leaders come and go. The mission of God is eternal. Leaders come and go. I'm in a season right now where 21 years I've been entrusted with the leadership mantle of this thing called Hope Church. But I'm in the process of transitioning that. And, Scott, you're one of those guys that um, would be an answer to question this question for me. Years ago, uh, we identified you as one of those potential leaders on our radar. Um, and, and, you know, we, we joked and told the stories about the early days and the, the retreats we went on where <laughs> oh, no. you were this young punk. Come on, let's, let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> but no joke, man. Uh, I said this, one of the great joys of looking back through the years is now seeing where you are and what God's done in your life and the intentionality of, of relationship where, you know, I've taken you on a bunch of trips and we've spent a bunch of time together and through the podcast, we've even been able to do a lot of stuff together. Um, but that there was an intentionality because I identified in you a young guy who rough around the edges. Sure. Need to develop. Absolutely. But a young guy who I saw Christ at work in your life and I wanted to be a part of, of helping to shape that. And now I look at you, Scott, and you're a guy who literally could lead any church in America. God's gifted you. God's shaped you. God's called you. God's equipped you. Um, and I feel like that's a part of the responsibility of us as leaders. So in leadership where you are, you should always be looking to work yourself out of a job. You should always be looking to find those around you. And one of the things, honestly, that made this transition that I'm in right now possible, because I've been asked a hundred times in the last 21 years to take other jobs, to go lead an organization, to go pastor another church. And every time the answer was always no, because when I looked at the calling that God had placed on my life at Hope Church, I saw the ministry and the, the call of God on my life. And I saw that what God had called me to do wasn't finished. This time, what made it possible for me to say yes was I looked around this room that we sitting in right here and, and this team, and I saw Scott guys like you and other guys on the team and went, they don't really need me anymore. And I'm not that, I mean, obviously, I could have stayed here another 20 years, but like you, you guys are equipped and ready to lead into a bright new future because there's been an intentionality. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He's writing to young Timothy. And Paul said, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
there was an intentionality in Paul to raise up the Timothys who could then teach the next generation, who could teach the next generation and continue to entrust. Everywhere Paul went into a ministry, to a city, he made disciples. And out of those disciples, an example is in Acts 14, but he'd go in, he'd make disciples. And out of those disciples, he identified potential leaders. He entrusted to them eldership, set them up, discipled them, prepared them, and then gave the ministry away. And so as leaders, we have to always be looking for potential leaders on your radar. Again, I would challenge you, think about the names. Who are the two, three, four people on your list that you're going, man, a little bit of time with them, and that, that's going to be something. They're going to be special. Um, and I'll just leave you with this thought. If you fail to plan to develop new leaders, you plan to fail in your mission as a leader. Um, when, when you leave something, if it crashes and burns after you left, it says a lot about your leadership while you were present. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't succeed in your absence, it says a lot about what you thought was success in your presence. Because if we've done it right and we've developed leaders, it should be, it should continue to, to enjoy the favor of God and the success beyond our leadership, not just while we're in leadership. So who's a potential leader that's on your radar? That's good stuff, and hopefully throughout this podcast, uh, Vance has given you numerous challenges just to evaluate your own life and leadership, and that was the point of this shorter podcast, just to to inject some challenge to you in, in whatever area you're leading on just these five questions that every spiritual leader should be answering. So hope you and your church family have an incredible Easter, and we will catch you in May of 2022 on the Vance Pittman Leadership Podcast. Thanks again for joining us today for the Vance Pittman Leadership Podcast. If you enjoyed what you've heard, we would love to help spread the word. You can drop a comment on YouTube, leave a review on your favorite podcast app, or share this episode on your social media. Thanks again for joining us.